The Labour Party national leadership has moved against the militant tendency in Liverpool. If the NEC uses this report, as I said, for bans, prescriptions and expulsions, we will campaign against that. And we are convinced that when they hear the real ideas of militants, and not as they're distorted in the media, the ideas of socialism, we will get the support of the rank and file. But whatever the outcome of today's meeting of Labour's national executive, it's quite clear that the long battle over militant is going to drag on for some time to come. Now, I'd just like to start with uh, a very good quote. Militants are brilliantly organised, brilliant auditors, <laughs> They plan things, know what they're doing, and keep at it. They are committed, they put the hours in, they go to meetings night after night, and they commit huge amounts of their own personal income and their lives. Now, I'll give you one guess. Michael Crick, they're the words of Michael Crick, on the Radio 4 programme briefing, which actually was about the militants, but we were excluded, even though we were interviewed before the meeting, about uh, our role in the labour movement and in general. And I'm almost tempted to hand Michael a join card. <laughs> <laughs> because, because you couldn't get a more laudatory introduction to this meeting than that. Now this comes after a lifetime, really, of Michael studying our ideas, culminating in two books, or the, the two editions of his book, the march of militants, um, but nevertheless, in, the, in the, the, the politest possible manner, I would say, that the aim of these books is not to completely explain our ideas. There are some very good chapters in the book in which our programme and our policy is explained. Unfortunately, I don't think Michael himself or the people that he's appealing to understand the full content of what we are trying to do. But nevertheless, the purpose of the book is to undermine the role of militants, militants as a political project, and really to give the impression that in some way we're sinister, we're underhand, we're not entirely to be taken at face value. And of course we dispute that, as I will explain in my opening remarks. And if you look at the, the, the front cover of, and I'd urge companies to buy this book, to read it critically, and if you agree with it obviously you would contact Michael. But on the front we read, Tom Watson, Deputy Leader of the Labour Party, a must-read for Labour activists. And then there's the front page which shows, did Hatton, did Hatton write Animal Farm? Hitler only destroyed half of our city. Hatton tried for the lot. Hatton, the godfather. Not exactly a neutral interpretation of our role in Liverpool. It's a biased role, which wasn't the case in the front cover of the early edition of militants itself. And it's part of the relentless propaganda which the ruling class and the bourgeois has aimed against our organisation. And I think that it's shown really in the front page uh, comments on, on, the, on the book in which Tom Watson is, um, is quoted. And, he's, and he talks about this as a, a must read for Labour activists. Well, that is disingenuous because it's a must read it's a manual, in a way, for right-wing political activists. It's not, in general, to arm the movement for the battles that are coming. And I think that the, the, the good parts of the book does touch on our ideas. He could have gone further, by the way, in the second edition in particular. Why not comment, not just on what we did in Liverpool or in general in the past, but what we achieved in the poll tax struggle in which we defeated Thatcher, generally recognised through a mass campaign of non-payment in which 18 million people refused to pay the, the poll tax itself. More importantly would be to recognise the changes that have taken place within the Labour Party. Our foundation of militants and our ideas were against right-wing social democracy and we were critical of left social democracy as well. The campaign to have us expel has nothing to do with the, the fact that we were organised. I mean, I was on the radio on Friday evening with the, on LBC with that towering intellectual John Mann, 
I mean, he makes Neanderthal man look progressive, quite frankly. <laughs> he, he repeats a mantra continually about, you know, you're organised, you're a party within a party, it was his mantra in the course of that discussion. And in, in essence, that's what uh, Michael did in the first uh, book itself. And this complaint of the right wing, we, we've never hidden that we were organised to get our point of view accepted. So were our opponents on the right, so were opponents on the left. And we now have raised the question, rather than this phony battle, the real complaint of the right, and many on the left, is that we were organised, they were organised, but we were much better organised than them. <laughs> and we got our point of view accepted by broad swathes of the labour movement itself. There's many features in the book. For instance, on violence, I think Michael gets it completely wrong in relation to militants' position. That could come out in the debate. The question of nuclear war, of course. We uh, are opposed to nuclear weapons. And obviously, everybody would fear some kind of nuclear conflict and so on. But nevertheless, we, we approach this in a sober fashion that there is a certain logic in the kind of doctrine of man, mutually assure, assured destruction, but nevertheless, we are opposed to nuclear weapons and we've, we've participated. In fact, I joined the movement on the basis of joining CND and from CND, the campaign for nuclear disarmament went on, joined the Labour Party Young Socialists, was a quasi-Marxist at that stage, I hope we've gone a bit further than that, and eventually joined those people who founded the militants in the early part of the 1960s. Now, we have put forward a petition, and Michael has tweeted that we're going to be turned down by the Labour Party. I don't know how he knows that. We'd like him to name names here. <laughs> <laughs> what was his sources in the Labour Party? And then he, he sent another tweet and said, well, uh, authoritative sources, I think it was, in Unite, have also said there's no chance of them joining. Who is it? We'd like to have a conversation with them sometime <laughs> to discuss the merits and demerits of our case. But we have sincerely put forward the idea we'd like to rejoin the Labour Party. After all, many on the left are saying, why don't you join the Labour Party? Why don't you join to strengthen Jeremy Corbyn in this battle against the right? And we said, OK. We are prepared to do that. And we've submitted uh, an honest and open approach to the Labour Party. We'd like to join. And we'd like to have the same rights as the co-op. Why didn't Michael Reichert write a book about the co-op? We <laughs> <laughs> were a separate party within a party since 1927, with their own MPs, with their own structure, their own national conference and so on. All the things that we are accused of would have made a very good book and prepared the way for our application to join the Labour Party on the same, with same terms as the co-op itself. We have between us a thousand years of membership of the Labour Party. As I said last night at the rally, that's going back to 1066, not that we've been members of the Labour Party <laughs> since 1066, but the combined membership of, of those people who've applied. I was a member of the Labour Party for 23 years before they decided to expel me. I was perfectly acceptable, along with many other colleagues who are here today. When we went out on the knocker and we canvassed for Labour MPs and Labour councillors and so on, earning our spares. When the Labour Party Young Socialists produced a document on the, on the Russian Revolution, ratified by the National Executive Committee. But then the campaign, when we became a force, and we, we trespassed into the Holy of Holies, we not only wanted to be councillors, but we also wanted to be MPs. No, no, that's not your role. Your role is to go out and canvass for us to become MPs, to become councillors and so on. That's the kind of top-down approach that the right wing and the Labour Party have always had. And the campaign was orchestrated at the very top of the ruling class. It was raised in Parliament by Thatcher. They were only doing what they've done since the Labour Party first was created, to try and nullify it, to turn it into a weapon for them, the second eleven of capitalism. We challenged that. And we not only challenged it in terms of ideas, we challenged it in terms of deeds as well. We were the ones in Liverpool in a very open and democratic way campaigned for a, a, ne a legal needs budget. And Michael in the book says, well, the battle would have taken place in Liverpool anyway. I can quote from it, if you like, in my second uh, contribution in this discussion. That's not true. As now Joe Anderson is carrying through in Liverpool a ruthless austerity regime in order to remain within the law. And not even that, by the way, because you could put forward a legal budget by raiding the reserves and preparing a mass campaign. But we decided 
on the basis of a democratic discussion and debate, we won over the ranks of the Labour Party in Liverpool and the trade unions. Why is there not on the front page of this book, Michael, the photograph of the mass demonstrations and general strikes that took place in Liverpool? That would have been a better feature of what happened in Liverpool rather than this, Liverpool against the militants, which was a demonstration of 5,000 people that absolutely disappeared after the demonstration. We used to joke they were the Golf Umbrella Brigade. Now we all carry golf umbrellas, but that's beside the point. <laughs> it was like a middle class uprising, a petty bourgeois revolt against the, the, the policies that were being put forward in Liverpool itself. So therefore, we think we have every right. We're not supplicants going into the Labour Party. We're not saying, please accept us. We have a record of struggle, second to none. We enter the Labour Party, we would strengthen the left. That's why those on the right, in the press, in general, in the Labour Party, and so on, are, are afraid of us. And as Michael points out in this book, this is going back to the 1980s. He points out that all organisations have their own organisation, their own structure. Solidarity at that time, pro-progress at this moment, are organised. That's in the nature of things. Why not say openly, we need a federation in the same way as the Labour Party, in its origins, was a federation between reformists, between Marxists, the Communist Party, were a constituent member of the Labour Party in its first period. And then the right wing, under the whip of the pressure of the ruling class, introduced bans and prescriptions against the Communist Party. That continued right up till the 1960s, and then gradually it was taken away because of the shift towards the left. That's when we came in to, uh, in, in, into being as a Marxist force campaigning openly for our ideas. And I think that this, this application to join, Michael might be right, it might be turned down. But as I said last night, that's not the end of the matter as far as we're concerned. We'll still fight for Jeremy Corbyn. We'll still fight for his anti-austerity programme. We will ruthlessly oppose the right within the party. We say openly there should be mandatory reselection. It's in Michael's book. He puts it as part of our programme. At least you have to admit we are consistent. We argued for it then. Not like John Lansman, who in the campaign for Labour Party democracy was an open, vehement exponent of mandatory reselection. Now he's dropped it. On what basis? Well, we have to get Jeremy Cor Corbyn elected in 2020. The problem with that is he might not get to 2020 unless mandatory reselection is introduced and the right wing are removed and the movement is renovated in the image politically of Jeremy Corbyn and the leftward moving workers who brought him to power. I think there's a possibility, by the way, such as the crisis in Britain, despite all the deficiencies in the hesitation of Corbyn now, he could be pushed into power. That's why the ruling class is so vehement against Jeremy Corbyn. And then, under the pressure of the working class, could begin to take radical measures. We would give critical support to that. Whether we're inside the Labour Party or outside of the Labour Party, we would adopt a positive approach towards this. But I, I repeat, we would be strengthened by being in the Labour Party. So, comrades, just in this opening gambit, read Michael's book, but read it critically. Look at our history and compare what he says in this book. There's many good features in this book, but there are many features in it which are just inaccurate. It really is an attempt to create a sinister image of uh, the militant and now the Socialist Party, and that is just not true. We never hide our ideas from the working class. The idea that we were secretly organised in some way was just an excuse to attack our political ideas. As I said, there were other trends who were organised in the Labour Party itself. We commend Michael for coming along and engaging in this robust conversation that we're going to have. I think all the Commons will treat him in the way that we do of anybody who is critical of our ideas, give him a fair hearing, and let's hope that we can all learn from this, including Michael himself, and he'll write a much more fair, <laughs> a, much more, uh, a much more accurate book of militants in the third edition. Thank you. Madam Chairman, Peter, comrades, um, I don't think I've ever been described as a member of the, uh, the ruling class before. Thank you very much indeed for that, uh, uh, that testimonial, Peter, for, uh, for my book. 
Um, and I promise you that on the uh, the next, actually, this is the the sort of the third edition because there was one in 1984 yes. called Militant, and then I did the March of Militant, and this is basically the March of Militant, which was published in '86, tops and tails. I didn't have time to go through it all again, um, and and uh, update it. And I'm amused by what you say about the uh, the photographs on the front cover because I had I just thought they were good photographs. Actually, I didn't really. Um, put a huge amount of thought into the content. But there is one up there. Uh, surely that's a positive photograph of uh, Tony Mulhern and uh, Derek Hatton, the, uh, the multi-millionaire, pony-owning, uh, <laughs> Spanish villa-selling uh, Derek Hatton. Whatever happened to him? I notice he's not on your list of um, expelled socialists that um, want to be readmitted to the party. No, at the, um, uh, I, uh, I take your point about the, uh, the front cover. You, you, uh, it, you do have a, uh, a slight point there. Um, the, um, yeah, I was very amused as, uh, when I was on a train on Friday to get this email from Hannah Sell about uh, your efforts to uh, rejoin the Labour Party. Um, and I immediately, as you say, uh, Peter, uh, tweeted about it. Um, the, um, and it particularly uh, amused me because I thought, well, it does put Corbyn on the spot. Uh, and indeed the National Executive Committee, because Corbyn, of course... <laughs> Way back in time, and as a follower of my uh, Twitter feed, Peter, you will remember, uh, some months ago I tweeted uh, a little advertisement from London Labour Briefing, which I can't find on my iPhone at the moment, but it's, uh, it's still there in the archives, of um, uh, the camp, I think it was called the Campaign Against the Witch Hunt. Uh, Secretary Jeremy Corbyn, 28 Lausanne Road, Haringey, North London. Got a, a good address for uh, followers of... Uh, of uh, Leon Trotsky, uh, but he, before he was an MP, was organising or helping to organise the efforts uh, to ensure that, uh, or try and ensure that uh, Peter and other uh, members of Militant were not expelled from uh, the Labour Party and of course failed. So uh, he's now rather put on the spot on this one, is Mr Corbyn, and it's also interesting that his office on um, Friday uh, refused to uh, comment on this uh, press release beyond saying that it's a matter for the National Executive Committee of uh, the Labour Party. So I uh, made other contacts and I spoke to a very uh, senior member of Unite who said uh, that it would be very unlikely uh, that uh, the former members of Militant uh, would be uh, readmitted to the Labour Party. I also exchanged texts with a leading left-wing member of the uh, uh, Labour Party National Executive Committee who said it was um, uh, that, uh, that you'd all have to go through the vetting process um, and that uh, Donald Trump was more likely to get through the vetting process <laughs> than you lot. Uh, so your chances, <laughs> your chances of readmission to the Labour Party don't seem very high at the moment, but that, but that may change, uh, sort of uh, from the point of view of being a journalist, a studier of these matters, a bit of a pity. It would have uh, stirred things uh, up a bit. But I am delighted to see in uh, both your leaflet and the... Um, press release that you, uh, that you, Peter, say, we have no wish to hide our background. And uh, that is repeated on this uh, leaflet. Because um, it seems to me that in your speech today, and uh, the, the, uh, on the rare occasions that I hear you these days or read something by you, that you are still hiding your background. Um, now, when I wrote the first edition of uh, Militant, uh, which came out in 1984, towards the end of my research, I went to see a man in Wigan. Uh, a man called Jimmy Dean, who um, will be familiar certainly to Peter and to, to some of you here today. And um, he, we had a, he, I went to see him at his home. Uh, he, uh, he'd, he'd obviously uh, uh, hit hard times a bit, he gave me a cup of coffee. Um, we had a long, long chat about the foundation of the Revolutionary Socialist League, which, as of course you all know, but will probably deny, uh, was um, the organisation that really was the uh, militant uh, tendency. And the Revolutionary Socialist League, as you all know, uh, was founded in 1955. Uh, Peter didn't come on the scene until a few years later. Um, and in 1962, helpfully, uh, they uh, drew up a constitution, which is published at the back of my book, um, pages uh, 333 to 337. And uh, Jimmy, a dean, when I went to see him in Wigan, said, well, look, I said, have you got any documents? He said, oh, I haven't got any documents here, no. Uh, he said, but I gave all my documents to Manchester Polytechnic, what is now, oh, five minutes to go, right, uh, Manchester Polytechnic, which is now, of course, Manchester Metropolitan University. So, 
I went along, asked to see the Jimmy Dean collection, and uh, I was uh, denied access on the grounds that I wasn't a bona fide academic uh, researcher. So I went off and found a bona fide academic researcher, um, a man called John Callahan, who's uh, written several books on Trotskyism and, uh, and the left. Um, and he went along to Manchester Polytechnic, and we filmed him going in, and he went in and took notes and wrote out in huge detail by hand, because he wasn't allowed to take any copies, uh, the militant constitution and lots of other militant uh, documents. And the militant constitution, adopted by the National Conference in, uh, of the RSL in 1962, says, um, all members holding public office, paid or otherwise, shall come under the complete control of the party and its organs. All members of the RSL are required to enter the mass organisations of the working class under the direction of the party organs for the purpose of fulfilling the aims of the party. It would be interesting to see how uh, that constitution compares with the constitution of the Socialist Party. Presumably, as General Secretary, you can uh, furnish me with a copy of the uh, constitution um, of, the, uh, of the Socialist Party. But there you have it. That was uh, the uh, RSL that you uh, made a deliberate decision to enter the Labour Party um, secretly, and you did organise secretly within the Labour Party. Uh, there were dozens, scores of former members of the RSL and of militant I spoke to, uh, some of whom we even filmed. We made a film for Channel 4 News in about 1985 of a man called Dean Nelson, who very helpfully took recording equipment in to three successive meetings of the Swansea uh, RSL militant branch. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the first week, the, the sound went down. The second week, the video went down. We only got it right for the third week. And he furnished me with lots more documents, many of which I already had, and all these wonderful documents where people's initials are reversed, and so Peter Tapp is uh, TP, and Ted Grant is GE, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and so on. Um, and uh, that uh, is the, the secret side, as you well know, of Militant and the RSL. And then, of course, you have this public front that from time to time holds public meetings and claims that all you really are is a bunch of uh, newspaper readers. Now, it seems to me that until uh, Peter and the rest of you are willing to come clean about all of that, then I can understand why the Labour Party might not want you back in there. Because, uh, the, uh, so far as I can see, uh, your aims are still that you should all enter the mass organisation of the working class under the direction of the party organs for, for, for fulfilling the aims of your party and that anybody holding public office, paid or otherwise, shall come under the complete control of the party, your party, the RSL, what was publicly known as Militant, now the Socialist Party. Um, and, and moreover, um, you are willing to, you frequently, uh, or at least you, you from time to time, exercise uh, far greater discipline than the Labour Party ever does to these people. Uh, you from time to time uh, expel people, and indeed you set it out in your constitution that people who don't go along with the party line will be uh, disciplined. And um, I don't know the ins and outs of what happened to uh, Ted Grant and his lot. Uh, you claim that they resigned, uh, but if they hadn't resigned, you would have thrown them out. Um, and uh, it seems to me that you're just as willing to um, uh, practice witch hunts against your enemies uh, within, the, within uh, the RSL and Militant and the Socialist Party as the Labour Party uh, uh, was willing uh, to do towards you and still seems to be willing if indeed uh, they're no longer willing to uh, accept you into um, membership. So really I think uh, the time has come for you to be open about your past, really end the lie. I mean all this denial that you're an organisation, denial that the constitution's genuine, the denial that you had a branch in Swansea or indeed anywhere else. Um, uh, you know, these secret national conferences you used to hold every year to which journalists were not admitted. All of this, why don't you just open up and say, yeah, we did do that. We had to do it for the following reasons. And, uh, yeah, we did tell lies. So, I mean, is the lie, are you carry on with the lie or are you now going to open up, own up to all of this secret past? Because until you do that, it seems to me that not only can you not really have a proper debate with the Labour Party about the terms on which you might rejoin the Labour Party, we're not actually going to have a very good debate here today either. Peter to respond. Again, 
By method of quotes, I hope to undermine the case <laughs> that Michael... The trouble is, you have read the book recently, and I haven't. <laughs> exactly. As a good journalist, always prepare before an interview. And this is what Michael writes in the uh, March of Militants. If Militants <coughs> is breaking the Labour Party's rules, so, strictly speaking, are many other Labour Party pressure groups. Labour Solidarity, Labour Coordinating Committee, and the Campaign for Labour Party Democracy, to name only three of the most prominent bodies. And that's sufficient to answer what is a total irrelevancy in going on about the RSL. I never joined any RSL. If it existed, it existed in the 1950s, and it's totally irrelevant oh, to... On. Yes, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. To, what, what bearing does that have on our ideas and us trying to convince people openly of our ideas today? Well, hang on a moment. Yeah. You, you said on Nat Channel 4 News in 1985 that this constitution here was a forgery. As far as I was concerned, it was. I've never seen that constitution. So where did Jimmy Dean get it from then? Is Jimmy Dean well, peddling Jim, false, doc I, I false I know, documents? I know Jimmy Dean better than you, Michael. I discussed with Jimmy Dean... He was one of the leading members of our organisation, party, grouping, if you like, when we were very tiny. We had no more than 40 people. The question that you've never asked is why did a small organisation or group of 40 people, based in Liverpool, mostly young, go from that to 8,000 members, three MPs, winning 240 constituency Labour parties when the Liverpool militants were expelled? with a huge reservoir of support. Do you think that the workers in the Labour Party, as you've explained, were not aware that we were organised? Of course we were organised. But you give it a sinister twist, and that fits in with the narrative of the bourgeois about revolutionaries. We openly proclaim our ideas. The real liars, if you're going to write a book, why don't you write a book about the, the discipline exercised, for instance, in the right-wing organisations like Progress, or, for instance, a book on the co-op. You've not answered that point. Why should the co-op have rights in the Labour Party and we don't? They're a separate organisation. What's wrong with having a new reconfiguration of the Labour Party that recognises the difference and that you organise for those ideas? You drag in by the hair this question of organisation and elevate it above what we stand for. We have grown and we will grow even more in the next period and we will exceed what we did in the 1980s on the basis of convincing working people of our ideas openly in discussions and debates of this character with all trends within the movement. We welcome debate and discussion. The difficulty we have is getting anybody to debate with us. It's to your credit that you came along here today, Michael. Because everybody would like an organisation without debates, if you like. <laughs> and we welcome debates, because in the clash of ideas, contrasting ideas are, the, are, are exposed, it clarifies it, and it takes the movement forward. So I hope you begin a very important trend within the Labour Party. Why are these anonymous people speaking to you? Why don't they openly proclaim who they are? I would, I would openly proclaim, yeah, I'm speaking here on behalf of uh, the Socialist Party, of the militants in the past. Why don't the senior Unite figures, and I'm going to, and why don't you give us their names, by the way, <laughs> so we can have a, so a friendly... Have a witch hunt. So we can, <laughs> no, no, not a witch hunt. So we can have a friendly debate with them, and we can raise the level of understanding of everybody, including Michael, about the tasks facing the Labour movement itself. We, we had, we openly said, we had 350 full-timers at one stage. We don't deny that. We were better organised. Where did those 350 full-timers come? At least the merit. In Michael Crick's book, we were accused by the Observer of Russian gold, of getting money from the Middle East, from the PLO, and so on. And he smashes that idea in the chapter in the book on the question of money. We raised it out of the, out of the pockets of ordinary working men and women. We didn't get large donations from the state. We didn't get large donations from rich individuals, a few made enormous sacrifices, as we did ourselves. I've never had a journalist wage. I got much, much lower than a journalist wage. And by the way, on reselection, I am due, due for reselection. If you join the military, you would have the right to propose the reselection of Peter, Peter Taff or join the Socialist Party today. Every official, every full-timer in our organisation is democratically controlled by the, by the rank and file. And that's the way we like it, because even we, in the hairy belly of events, 
We can become under the pressure and we have to have the, the control of the rank and file. As to expulsions, we have never expelled anybody from our organisation on the basis of a difference in policy. Even in Scotland, when we had a difference with Tommy Sheridan, and they, they said, look, the differences are too great. They, they, in our opinion, adapted to nationalism. Our comrades in Scotland remained very firm. And Tommy Sheridan and Alan McCombs came to us and said, we'd like an amicable divorce here. He said, there's no such a thing as an amicable divorce. And we're not going to expel you, because we think if you stay in our ranks, we will convince you of our ideas. We have expelled people on the basis of sexism, of homophobia, of other issues which other organisations have done. We didn't expel Ted, Ted Grant on the basis of any political differences. We had a debate and we had a discussion, and we wanted that discussion to continue. But they stopped paying subs to us, or donations to us, as you would put it. They stopped giving money to uh, our, our, our organisation at that stage. They had a separate organisation. We don't deny them the right to have a separate organisation. I thought there wasn't any organisation. <laughs> no, of course, <laughs> no, of course there was an organisation. Oh, right. We, we no. said before, <laughs> Michael, not just with you, we went before the National Executive Committee of the Labour Party. And I was interviewed by Dennis Healy, who said, you're, you're organised. <laughs> <laughs> you were a party within a party, Mr. Tom. <laughs> I said, well, you're a representative of the CIA, Dennis. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. He said, I said, you were financed by the CIA. It's all documented. Michael Crick will probably do a book on that. <laughs> That's what's great. The connection between the right wing and the CIA. And, and it's, it's open. It's there. And they said, well, you were organised. Of course we're organised. Do you think we just spontaneously come together in meetings? Of course, we are organised. And we were organised to take on other people within the movement and argue against their ideas. What is wrong with that? Get away from this, this quarry idea, dragged in by the hair, that's an excuse for not discussing our ideas. That's the important thing. I'd like to hear you, as a long-standing investigator of the ideas of militants and now the Socialist Party, what you think is incompatible in our ideas a membership of the Labour Party. Is it incompatible with the aims and the objectives of the Labour Party? Parliament, democracy, we're prepared to answer on all those questions. But we are consistent. We go to the end of the struggle against capitalism. I'll leave it there because we want people to come into the debate. I can't, I can't resist the opportunity to come back on some of that. And I have to congratulate you, Peter. You, as General Secretary of uh, the Socialist Party and Militant and the RSL before that, way back until the 1960s, uh, even though you deny the existence, you must be the longest, certainly the longest serving party leader this country has ever had, and probably one of the uh, longest serving party leaders um, in the world. Uh, it's interesting you say that you have, uh, uh, the, that you are up for reselection. Has he, has he ever been opposed? Ever? In all his time? They're doing the job, right? There we are, right. But it's. it's, it's Why don't you join and oppose me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure you'd really have me. I'm not sure you'd really have me. In any case, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I'm not a socialist. I'm not a member of the Labour Party. Uh, I'm not even left wing. Uh, I mean, I used to be. Uh, but uh, I'm, uh, I'm not your, um, your uh, type of um, uh, member. But wh why, why do you need? 350 full-timers to run a newspaper uh, with ideas. That is, this is the organisation of a political party, a political party that infiltrated, <laughs> as the constitution of the RSL laid down, in, adopted in March 1962, that infiltrated the Labour Party, and whose members, whose member, the members of the RSL, or militant, uh, and presumably the Socialist Party, when you re-enter the Labour Party, as you wish to do, and they'll probably stop you, but if you were allowed to re-enter the Labour Party, your, the loyalties of the members of that Socialist Party would be to the Socialist Party uh, and not to the Labour Party. And how can a political party uh, operate... Can I just interject? Uh, 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 yeah, can I make sure. a parliamentary yeah. introduction? Sorry, Michael, take it off my time. But, yes, there's a loyalty to our ideas and to uh, the organisation of the Socialist Party. But if you're in a mass organisation with the three MPs and the councillors, those councillors are under the direction of the party, the broad party as well. In other words, there's dual control over them, not solely to us. They have to get the support of the rank and file of that broad party, and that's what they did. And there was no difference between 
them on policy and programme because we convinced the rank and file of our ideas. Well, what about those areas where you've got a Socialist Party councillor or a member of parliament, you would hope for again one day, uh, and uh, uh, they are also Labour Party uh, councillors and so who, who are their loyalties to? Their loyalties to the Socialist Party or to the Labour Party? You can't just say, well, we'd hope to convince the local Labour Party because in a lot of those places you may not convince of the course. local Labour Party and certainly you won't convince that you're unlikely to convince the National Party. And we accepted the discipline of that party. And you we can't, com you can't for compare it with a co-op party. The co-op party is a pretty insignificant party uh, whose, whose policies are not that different from the Labour Party. Your policies are radically, or at least in the past, they have been radically different from the Labour Party. Uh, maybe not uh, these days. But it, that is the crucial, that is one of the crucial problems. The second problem is that why do you need all this secrecy? Why do you need these secret branches meeting once a week or maybe twice a week? I can't remember now. In Swansea. Is Alex Thraves here? Yes. Right. Yes. There we are. And, and, and I remember we came down with Dean Nelson to Swansea and he, and he took in all the recording equipment um, and, uh, and came out with all the documents. It took me ages to read them all. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and you came on our screen and denied that any of this was going on. Now, do you accept now that you were lying? Dean Nelson was an honest chap, wasn't he? Well, it, 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 we, we were engaged in a certain amount of subterfuge, but oh. we had to... We had to <laughs> <laughs> exactly. yeah, of course, of course, because it was to expose the bigger lie. And, 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 and there you were on the street, Mr Thraves, Telling our cameras that there was no branch, there's no militant branch in Swansea. There were not secret meetings um, that are held. I can't remember whose house it was. A certain address. I, you'll, you'll, you'll no doubt remember. You probably still live there, or, or you still got <laughs> you still got offices there. Um, but uh, this is what this is. Th th you know, if, if it's all open, if you are, uh, what was the phrase you used in your press release? You know, wish to hide. Well, why did A come clean about how it operated in the past, and more important, come clean about how you plan to operate if you did rejoin the Labour Party. So if you did rejoin the Labour Party with a status akin to the co-op party, would you propose to carry on with this secretive organisation, with secret branches um, and uh, a, a, a secret uh, central committee and a secret national committee uh, and uh, international links, separate international links, your own international organisation, which we haven't touched on yet and which you, are, you were in the militant members of the Labour Party days, uh, especially uh, sensitive, uh, uh, sensitive about. We need to know, the Labour Party needs to know as well, whether you propose to carry on with the same methods that you did in your previous entrance period uh, next time round. I suspect you do, because you really uh, haven't changed much, uh, policy-wise, ideology-wise. Um, and essentially, you, are, you also have... A, a different philosophy to the Labour Party. The Labour Party is still committed to change through parliamentary uh, democracy. You are not. You are ultimately committed to revolutionary change. You are Lev Marxists and Leninists and Trotskyists, and you ultimately want to have, bring about revolutionary change along the lines of 1917 uh, in this country, uh, rather than through uh, the ballot box and through parliamentary democracy. Occasionally, it's convenient to have a few uh, militant MPs like Dave Nellist and Terry Fields and Pat Wall, although it, it, was never, it was unclear in the end whether Pat Wall was militant at the end. Um, but uh, those, are just, uh, those are just vehicles to spread the word, to recruit uh, new members. Uh, ultimately, you have got a very different philosophy from the Labour Party. Uh, and I'm sure we would at least agree on one thing, that militant, uh, as it was in the past as members of the Labour Party, and momentum, as operating today, are totally different kinds of body. Uh, they may be, uh, may be impressed by some of the ways you used to organise within the Labour Party and may have adopted some of those, but they are not the same uh, as uh, the militant or Socialist Party or the RSL, um, uh, uh, ideologically or in terms of internal well, uh, discipline. But they're accused of being a party Sorry. within a party. Uh, they are accused of being a party within a party, yes. And, uh, and, and there are other parties within a party, as I say in the book. But the scale of your party, ah, I mean, you so were... So. <laughs> <laughs> you were... <laughs> Ran about your heyday, which was what, about 1984, I suppose, when you had supposedly 8,000 members, although I'm always sceptical about people's members, a lot more sceptical nowadays, now I'm twice as old than I was at the time. Um, you were about the fourth largest party in Britain, um, after Britain, Labour, Conservatives and Liberal Democrats. Not now, because you've now got some, um, uh, you wouldn't be on those numbers now, because we've now got the emergence of other parties. <laughs> but, um, uh, the, the, uh, yeah, you, are, you were a party within a party, but a party within a party ultimately committed 
to a different kind of transformation, which is revolutionary change and not parliamentary change. And I, I would have thought, from the Labour Party's point of view, and as I say, I'm not a Labour Party member, I don't even vote Labour or indeed vote for anything else anymore, but from the Labour Party's point of view, I would have thought that was pretty fundamental. Smile when Michael said about uh, well conspiratorial and secretive methods because I smile because those were the methods that Michael used uh, when he was down in Swansea exposing uh, militant as we were at that pace. He was a fresh faced Michael Crick and I came down with his new team, news team allegedly to show that Swansea was going to become the next Liverpool because of the growing influence and support uh, that we had in the area. But of course, that was a sham. I uh, you know the real reason and the real story, which was later reported in ITN's uh, internal newspaper, uh, was to have the TV expose uh, that Militant was a party within the party. Uh, they wired him up, as he said, to come into the branch meeting, to tape the branch meeting, to have the TV cameras in the van across the road in the dark, filming us. You know, those are the methods that Michael used. But all publicity, to be honest, is good publicity. And Michael's expose. Uh, I was astonished. It was a top news item when they came out. Uh, demoted uh, the US's bombing of Libya into second place. <laughs> there was the militant supporters in Swansea, uh, you know, pushing that down into the uh, second, uh, second news item uh, there. But what impact did it have in Swansea? The tremendous impact. We doubled the number of militant branches in, in Swansea. People, people were supporting us, uh, you know, over because of the conditions, not because we were seated, it because of the social and economic conditions, and they wanted a change. And that, that's why I think, uh, you know, the relevance is that those conditions are, are reoccurring today. Roger Bannister, Liverpool. I uh, joined the Labour Party when I first went to university in 1970, because I am older than I look. <laughs> and I joined, the, I joined the Labour Party because I was a socialist. But I was in the Labour Party for nearly 10 years before I became a militant supporter. That wasn't because I hadn't met militant. In fact, when I joined in Bristol University, the leading figure was Andy Bevan, who made national uh, news at the time when he became the youth officer nationally for the Labour Party. But I eventually decided to join the militant. I'd moved around a bit, but it was because I realised that despite being a socialist, and despite being in the Labour Party, I'd spent almost 10 years doing nothing but donkey work for the right wing. Some of the people that I have canvassed for go down as a sort of a rose gallery of the right wing of Labour. I've canvassed for Kilroy Silk in uh, Nosey. I've canvassed when she was a councillor, not an MP, for Louise Ellman up in Skelmersdale. Now uh, right wing Labour MP calling for a witch hunt in uh, my own constituency of uh, Riverside in uh, Liverpool. A guy who's no longer with us, Michael Maguire, horrendous right-wing MP for Insin Makerfield, an area around Wigan. It was against that background that I decided to join, uh, the, uh, become a militant supporter, as it was, <coughs> at the time, and really nobody batted an eyelid. The only time it became controversial wasn't because I was going around selling the paper at meetings or anything like that. No one bothered about that. It only became controversial when we built the base and used the base in Liverpool, by which time I'd become the, I was a member of the District Labour Party <coughs> in Liverpool. I was the secretary <coughs> of Broad Green Constituency Labour Party, where we had sadly departed comrade Teddy Fields as uh, our MP. And it was only when we used the strength that we built up to push for socialism through the city council and through having uh, socialist MPs putting the rest of them on the uh, Labour benches in Parliament to shame. That was when it became controversial. That was when people started accusing us of being a party within a party and saying what nasty people we were. That was the basis of the witch hunt when I was expelled with others in, uh, in 1986. When we were seen as just a left group <coughs> that were prepared to do all the donkey work, no one worried about selling papers or having readers' meetings. But once we got that backing from working people, that was when we became controversial, and that's what the whole thing's about, even to this day. Yeah. I think you'll find the reason Derek.
Derek's not on the list. He's already in the Labour Party. <laughs> Derek is not so right wing that he, he would qualify for the Labour Party, as we all know. I think um, one, one point I, uh, I seen in the book about uh, if you go to a militant readers' meeting, you have to pay to get in, pay for the food, pay for the drinks, uh, do a raffle, and then they, 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 uh, they'd have a fighting fund. And people were hiding money in the shoes to get the bus home. <laughs> well, any meeting I went to, you'd have to take your shoes off. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and it all walked home together. So there was no, uh, no one was hiding money uh, in, in that period. And one of the things uh, I always like to say is uh, multi-millionaire Lord Kinnock, one of the things he said when I went on the council in 1983, well, I was already on the council, but we took him to in 83, that the time's not right. Well, I was 33 then, and I'm 66 now. Has anyone got any idea when the time <laughs> was right? We used to meet in a pub called Levine, and, and if you didn't get in early, you couldn't get a seat because the journalists were all in there. And any time you're seen on TV, uh, any awards going, it was always 100%. The local paper uh, who got it was the Echo for uh, exposing militants, uh, the, the Guardian, everyone, including uh, the comrade in the front, they're all getting awards uh, for, 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 you know, for having to go with militants. But one of the things that uh, was said about the, the Umbrella Brigade, a lot of the letters in the Liverpool Echo was like Tarquin from the Whittle or Penelope from Southport. It, they weren't in Liverpool, they were outside. And nearly all them people that were on those anti-militant things weren't Liverpool. They were from outside of Liverpool, from the more affluent areas. Uh, it were, all, were all Tory voters, you know, Tory voters anyway, you know. And uh, I'm proud to say that I was a militant supporter in, in the 70s and the 80s, and I'm, I'm still in the organisation at the moment. And anyone that didn't realise that we were organised at any stage would have to be an absolute idiot. <laughs> you know, it was quite obvious uh, that, that, that we were. But one thing you've got to say, on the City Council, which Liverpool City Council in the archives call it the Militant Council, even the, the City Council now do, there was only 11 comrades on that, 11 you know, sub-paying comrades on that, on that council. 49 got got done, but two died, so only 47 got surcharged. It was our ideas that were, were, were won over. Uh, and when we took control in 1983, we won wards that were Liberal wards and Tory wards. And what you've got to realise is, the vote held up for the Liberals and Tories. The way we didn't convince Liberals and Tories to vote Labour, like the Labour Party's trying to do now, Labour voters seen there was something worth voting for. And they came out and voted. So they were still getting, say, 3,000, and we got 4,000 and beat them. And that's how we did it. And that went on for many years, uh, that they, they were doing that. Uh, I've been told I've only got four and five more minutes, so... Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'll finish on that and sit down. Then. <laughs>